I believe that there's no evidence for any God or gods. I believe in the existence of God and he plays an important role in my life. I believe that morality doesn't stem from religion. Rather, it's a product of empathy which exists in all healthy living things. I believe in the principles of Jesus Christ to guide my life. I believe faith is not the absence of doubt, but a tool we can use to examine our faith and strengthen it. I believe that stories connect us. From our earliest campfires to our latest sitcoms, stories are where we go to find our shared past and our place in today's crowd. I don't disagree. <laughs>
So I'm eight years old, and Pastor Bill Watson goes up and he delivers his sermon, and I had listened intently to what I had heard in the Sunday school class from a very animated Sunday school teacher. And now Pastor Bill Watson has told basically the same story again. And the service ended. We're headed towards the back, and Pastor Bill did what Pastor Bill always did, which is to go and stand in the back of the room and shake everybody's hand and thank them for coming on their way out. And there's like 150 of us in line to shake his hand. But I'm eight years old, and I don't have any sense of like decorum or timing or anything like that. So I said, Pastor Bill, I have a question. And he said, what is it, Gary? He doesn't come down to my level. He just looks down at me. He said, what is it, Gary? And I said, Pastor Bill, is everything in the Bible true? Not a small question, but a small person asking this question. And he looked at me, and then he looked at my mother, who was standing there with me, and they exchanged the same look that parents exchanged between each other when they talked about Santa Claus. Like they knew something that I didn't. And I remember feeling embarrassed by that. And he patted me on the head, literally patted me on the head, and then shoved me down the line and sent me on my way. Now, there's a million really good answers to that question that I've learned since then. But condescension typically isn't one of them. But I stay in this church because it's where all my friends are. It's where my family goes every Sunday. It's where, we go. It's where I go to Awanas on Wednesday. It's part of my, I'm part of this community. It's what I do. So four years later, I'm 12, and I start to get pressured to get baptized. And so I agreed to get baptized. And now, again, this is Wisconsin, and it's uh, January. Now, I know a lot of people here are, aren't familiar with um, what it's like in places like that, but uh, in the north, almost all the places have basements because you can't really walk around on the regular floor when it's in contact with the ground because the ground freezes and it makes the floor super duper cold, right? So there's some physics here, but, but moral of the story is that when there's no basement, the floor is freezing. Especially when it's January in Wisconsin and it's minus four degrees outside, which it is, you know, for three months out of the year. So anyway, so it's time for me to get baptized and I get called in the back and me and two other people, a young woman is probably 22 or whatever, and then another teenage boy, and we get told uh, to go in the back, and we get in the back, and we've got these white robes that we're going to put on. We're told to strip down to our underwear. We have a place we can change, but we've got no socks and no pants and just kind of our underwear and this robe on. <clears throat> Where this was, there's no basement. So there was a basement under this church because there was a or under the sanctuary, rather, because that's where the Sunday school classes were. But where they had built on this baptismal area was an addition. There's no basement. So the three of us are standing back there for 25 minutes. By the time it's, you know, the, the choir starts to sing and it's time for us to do the baptismal part of the presentation here, it's, we're freezing. Like, we're shivering cold. So the young lady goes first, because we want to get this over with. And so she goes forward, and she, she walks through. She gets stung. She comes out the other side. And now it's my turn. And I step up to the side of the baptismal. And it's probably about, this, about the size of this rug here. And it's, it's warm water. And if you've ever been to the north, and you know, like if you go outside and your hands get really, really cold, Right? And then you come inside and you run your hands under even cool water. It feels like your hands are burning. Right? Everybody's familiar with this feeling and people know what I'm talking about? Okay. So this was my whole body. Because we'd been standing in the cold for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So I step one foot in the water and both feet in the water and like I'm on fire. So I stop for a moment, but the Choir's only going to sing for so long. And there's Pastor Bill standing in the water, waving me in. And who am I to stop a good show, right? I mean, like, I'm not going to interrupt a show, right? Like, there's a presentation going on here. Like, I signed up for this. We're going to go do it. So I step down into the water, and my whole body is on fire. And I just want this done as fast as we can possibly get it done. He dunks me. Even my ears burn. 
He dunks me in the water. He says something when he pulls me back up. I don't remember what it was because I was just trying to get out of the water. I get up out of the water to the other side of the baptismal where there is, again, no basement, and there's no one with a towel. I am now soaking wet and freezing. And in the north, we know to take hypothermia pretty seriously. So you recognize the symptoms of hypothermia, hypothermia almost immediately. So as soon as I start to get that shake where I can't stop and my teeth are starting to slam together, I take off the robe as fast as I can and start drying myself with my clothes in my underwear at 12 years old in front of a bunch of people. None of which thought to bring a towel for the kid in the white robe in his underwear. This is when I started to have second thoughts about my community. Change churches again. Now I kind of gone to a different church than my family had. I started going to church with my, with my friend Matt, and we were going to uh, Racine, uh, Wisconsin, to a, to a much bigger church, uh, Calvary, Calvary Church. I can't remember exactly what denomination they were. It was kind of a denominational church. And I'd made some very good friends in this group. I had a girlfriend in this group. I had some other uh, male friends, and it was a very active church, so there was something on Tuesdays and Sundays and Fridays, and there was always something happening, and they had a youth pastor that, like, always was checking on us and making sure everything was fine, and it was cool. And then we got asked to go on this mission trip to Canada, because I guess they've never heard of Jesus. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I, I said, okay, whatever. And so I go up there, and it's a 10-day trip. We take a bus from Kenosha, Wisconsin, to Sault Ste. Marie, um, and then around into some place in Canada. It was a beautiful country. And then I, when we got there, I realized that we were not just missioning to like regular Canadians, we were on a Native American reservation. And I, I had just finished learning about the convert and conquer philosophy of the Europeans. And here I was, as white as the day is long, standing in this Native American reservation, telling them about Jesus. Um, now, I will say, the youth pastor, very smart man, very kind man, no doubt. And he knew that mm, I probably wasn't the right person <laughs> to be up there, like leading prayers or citing verses or anything like that. Uh, so my job was a uh, recreation director. So my job, like when it was time to play kickball, I was the one who ran the kickball game, right? That was my, my, my mission, whatever. So we're there for 10 days, and it's the night before we're going to leave, and we've got this very serious uh, session with the youth pastor around a campfire uh, at our campsite. And this is like our last night, and he leads this very moving story and sermon, and there's like eight or 10 of us teenagers and this youth pastor. And at the end of it, he, we're around this beautiful campfire in this incredibly beautiful place, and he, and he asks us to, to partake in silent prayer for 45 minutes while we listen to the fire, smell the smoke, enjoy the nature that we're in, and feel all of God's majesty, was I believe the phrase that he used. And I sat there and I prayed harder than I have ever prayed. I wanted it, I wanted it bad. And nothing came, nothing came. I felt nothing. I felt like I had wasted my time. I felt that I had been abandoned by whatever it is that I was looking for. Um, and while that wasn't the moment that I became a, an atheist, the seeds had clearly been planted by Bill Watson when I was eight, right? And when I was 12, they got a little water. It was hot water, but they got a little water. And then when I was older, as a teenager, they really started to take root and really started to bloom into a, a completely different understanding even, and it was hard because I didn't want to leave my tribe, right? This, this was my tribe. 
Um, so it was, a, it was a really challenging time for me spiritually and emotionally. And of course, I got all the other bullshit that teenagers have got going on in their lives at the same time. So I'm trying to wrestle with, why don't I feel this? My friends feel this. My parents feel this. Why don't I feel this? There must be something wrong with me. But then why didn't I get an answer? Why didn't I feel what they felt? I, just, I didn't understand. And that lack of understanding led me to a whole nother line of thinking. But that's another story. Thank you. Sean Mosley. Sean Mosley. He's my favorite. I hated church growing up. <laughs> uh, it was so boring, the church that I went to. And my mom was like the church secretary, and she was a minister. And so we were the first ones there and the last ones to leave. And I swear, like one summer, I looked up and we were at church every day of the week and twice on Sundays. And one day I just got fed up. Wednesdays was the worst. I hated Wednesdays to this day. Thursday is my favorite day of the week because it is the farthest away from Wednesday. <laughs> one Wednesday we get ready to go to church and I was like, or the day of, I made a plan. I wasn't trying to miss church. I just wanted to be an hour late. Like, let's cut one hour off of these three or something. And my mom was a stickler on being on time. Nothing would make her matter than to be late. And I was like, forget this. And it was the 90s, so people didn't have cell phones. And we relied on the VCR. And before it was time to go to church, we would sit in the living room me, my brother, and my two sisters, and we would sit there and we would wait until it was time to go to church. And we would watch TV. And my mom was there. And that day, I had turned back the time on the VCR. And so we sitting there, we were watching TV. And next thing we know, Wheel of Fortune comes on. And usually we know, Wheel of Fortune come on, we supposed to be out of the house. And everybody starts looking around like, something ain't right. We look at the VCR and the VCR say, it ain't time to go yet. And so, we just looking at each other. And I know what's going on, but don't nobody else know what's going on. Next thing you know, one of my sisters, they get on the phone and they call time. That was back in the day. You could call time and find out what time it was. Time says that the VCR was off by an hour, and now it's a problem <laughs> because my mom is late and somebody about to get it. And everybody, all of my brothers and sisters, they look back at me because I'm known for messing with stuff. And it was like, did you mess with the time on the VCR? It's like, yeah, I did. But one of my sisters saved me. She was like, he must have thought it was daylight savings time. Ain't that right, Sean? So yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> My mom admonished me when we was off to church. We was late, 30 minutes, <laughs> and I was happy. I didn't die, and we were late. When I turned 18, I was like, man, I ain't going to church no more. <laughs> I'm grown now. I'm an adult. I ain't got to go to church. You can't make me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm gonna work these shifts at Mickey D's on Sunday so I won't have to go. And my mom, she didn't really bother me. And I'm 18 and I'm trying to be an adult, but I keep running up against these adult problems. And at that time, even though I was raised in church and grew up in church, I didn't really believe in God. I believed in God like a genie in a bottle, like if I'm in trouble, God, get me out of this. If I needed some money, God, hook a brother up or something like that. But other than that, I really didn't have a belief in God. 
And so trying to be an adult, I would run into these problems. And that was the first thing I would do. It was like, man, God, you got to get me out of this. God, you got to save me out of this. And one of my best friends from high school, he was a, a preacher's kid. And one day I was having some problems and I was like, man, you got to help me. You in touch with God, your dad a pastor, hook a brother up. <laughs> Maybe you can get one of these prayers through. And he tried to get me to come to this church, but I didn't want to. And his mother was working on me to come to church. Her name was Mother Pat Norwood. Um, and my excuse for not coming to church was I didn't, they got dressed up and stuff like that, and we wasn't doing all that. And so she decided that she would buy me a suit the first suit I ever had, she bought it for me just so I could come to her church and feel comfortable. And so she bought me the suit. I got to tell you, I look nice. I did. And I went to church. And their church, they were apostolic Pentecostal. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> uh, they got dressed up. The women didn't wear pants. And the women wore these things on their head. And I was like, what is going on? And when I went to their church, it was a lot different than the church I grew up in. They were much livelier. The music was faster and better. And the preacher, he was screaming at people. And they were screaming back at him. And preach, preacher. I was like, whoa, what is going on? That don't happen at my church. <laughs> and people are running. And people are shouting. And... When you first look at it from the outside looking in, you know, it looks crazy. It looks funny. It looks like, what is going on with these people? But I, I had to take a step outside of what I saw with my eyes and look at the people who were displaying these emotions in church. And these were real people. Like, these were people who were going through things. These are people who were dealing with situations Monday through Friday. These are people, especially in the African-American community, where sometimes you got to put a face on Monday through Friday. But when Sunday came, they could be who they really wanted to be, or they could let loose. And to me, it was something special. And so I started going to their church, and they told me, you need to be baptized. And I was like, okay. They showed me in the Bible, said, you need to be baptized. I was like, all right, I'll be baptized. And this was in Michigan, and we didn't have no heated pool. It was cold in November. And I got baptized in the cold pool. And I was like, all right, I'm baptized now. And they was like, oh, well, you need to speak in tongues, too. I was like, huh? <laughs> I heard about speaking in tongues and all these other different things. I, I even had tried it before, but it didn't work for me. And so they taught me how to pray. And they taught me how to receive the Holy Ghost. And it wasn't working for me. Some other people that came in at like the same time as me and came after me. And it was like they would walk through the doors and they'd be speaking in tongues. I was like, I've been trying for a month. And I'm not getting this. What's going on? And it was a thing like somebody had said, like, it's nothing wrong with God. It might be something wrong with you. And I think it was something wrong with me because I didn't really believe in God. Even though I was going to church, even though I was baptized and I went through all these steps, I still only believed in God as like a genie in the bottle. But one day, they were having a prayer meeting, and I decided, I'm going to get this today. Today is my day. And I'm praying, and I'm doing everything that they told me to do. And I hear a voice. And I say it's a voice because, I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it. But it was like something on the inside of me, like myself talking to myself or something. And it was so clear. And it told me, it reminded me of a prayer that I prayed earlier, a couple of weeks ago. 
not only did it remind me of the prayer, but then it also reminded me how that prayer was answered. And in that moment, a couple of things started to happen. The words that were coming out of my mouth, they changed to some words and some language that I didn't understand. Also at the same time, this feeling had came over me of just like the most immense and intense joy that I've ever felt in my life. It was like having a thousand birthdays in one moment. It was like being let off a death row a thousand times. It was that intense. And from that moment on, I could point to this thing that happened to me and that was happening to me and something that was also happening in the Bible. And from that moment on, I didn't just believe in God as a genie in the bottle. I believed in the God from the Bible. And I went from that kid who was changing time on the VCR just so I can get out of church to a person that was like, wow, I get to go to church now. Thank you. All right, so uh, what do you believe? In the wisdom, in the, oh, okay. in the wisdom of ignorance, ultimately a lifelong struggle and search. Okay. All right, I can. What I can. do you believe? Organized religion does as, is that Mordor? <laughs> <laughs> Organized religion does add much more than does much more good than than more harm than good. Is that I'm just trying to make context now. Maybe that's the atheist reading it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> My bad people. I'm sorry, I got a bias. I don't know what to say. She's writing in Thomas. That's the A answer right there. Uh, God is everywhere in a relationship with others, nature, love, and kindness. It's our job to share that love the best way we can through our gifts. Very nice, very nice. What do you believe? That God is really just a collective conscience that encourages us to do the right thing, make the most of your time here because when you die, you die. All right. Uh, what do you believe? That the belief in God or gods is outdated and that religion and its followers are a huge determined to, to a huge determined deterrent to the advancement of our society and the world at large. God is in everything. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> Dave. All right. What do you believe? God is in everything except the church, mosque, etc. Amen. That's what, that's what it says there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, whoever wrote this, I'm I'm buying your next glass of water at the bar. What do you believe? I believe the children are our future. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're back. So, the question, question number two, in about 10 words, how did you find your faith or lose it? By reading the Bible in church, and they've circled, lost it. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is more than 10 words. It's not even close. It's not even about 10 words. We'll give it a try, though. That's right. This is, this is the, the book of Unbelievable. I found my faith a long time ago. Dealing with cancer and other things I, should, I know should have killed me, I know there's a God in heaven watching over me because I have not reached my full potential or my destiny. Okay. Huh. Interesting. This is a nice dovetail onto my story. 
around a campfire on the side of a 14,000 foot mountain asking if, if he exists. He with a capital H, so I will assume that they found God. By hitting my bottom, I found hope and humility. The preached word of God and the teachings from the Bible. How they found it. That's John Mosley, everybody. He's one of my favorite people. He's one of my favorite people. Hey. I want to say y'all are doing so great. <laughs> this couple of people may have come in or thought that the show was going to be much more tense. Uh, the last pillar we were at, this guy he yelled out, when is Gary versus the preacher? I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was scared, like something is going to happen to me. Uh, but <laughs> in about 10 words, how did you find your faith or lose it? Mushrooms. <laughs> In about 10 words or less, I've been given faith by others and had it taken away by the same. I lost my faith when I saw how internal church politics were more important than the faith itself to the elders of my church. So I got another story for you. Um, when I was about 23, well, I was exactly 23. I moved to Memphis for a couple of reasons. One, because Memphis is better than Saginaw, Michigan. <laughs> Two, my beautiful wife is from here. And three, I came to uh, be a preacher and a minister and to basically be like the assistant pastor of the church here. That same church that I grew up in had two churches, one in Saginaw, Michigan, and one here in Memphis. And I moved here so that I could uh, be like the assistant pastor. And one of the things I noticed about Memphis was that it is a very, religious place. <laughs> and one of those religions that I picked up on was barbecue. <laughs> um, there are different denominations of this barbecue religion. Some people like wet, some people like dry, some people smoked, however it is. And then there are institutions that are built to these different denominations. Tops, Corky's, Rendezvous, whatever you may like. And just like church, sometimes the best place to go is one of those little holes in the walls that don't nobody know about. And one day um, after church, we're driving home and my wife, she says that she's hungry. And I ask her, where does she want to go? And my wife, she believes in two things. She believes in Jesus. She believes in coupons. <laughs> because they both save. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I got a coupon for this place. And I was like, I ain't never heard of that. But she said she had a coupon for it. And so we went to this, to this hole in the wall place and I got there and indeed it was a little hole in the wall place. And I go in and I give the order and I sit down in a little waiting area and they got some tables and stuff out there. And I'm a professional people watcher. Like I'm really good at it. I give people backstories and names and everything and I focus in on one particular couple. So a white couple, probably like mid 40s, and I can't take my eyes off of them because the guy, he is devouring this barbecue. Not only is he devouring it, but like 
I'm looking in his mouth and he only has a sprinkle of teeth. And I'm like, how is he doing this? I don't know. And inevitably, science kicks in and this dude starts choking. And I gave him a name, I, I called him Sprinkles. Uh, Sprinkles starts choking. The woman that's with him, I call her Sparkle, she going crazy like, somebody help him, help him. There's one manager, he's taking orders, he's busting tables, he's bringing food out. This dude is a super manager. He comes over without breaking a stride and he just starts performing a Heimlich on Sprinkles and he is going at it, like bam, bam, bam. It was like something straight out of a movie or a TV show. And I watched enough TV that I was like, oh, this is only gonna take like two or three pumps and it's gonna be over. But no, it was going on and on and on. I was like, wow, couldn't have been me <laughs> as the manager. But, and I'm just trying to figure out like what's going on. After a while, super manager, he gets tired. And so he, he tries something new, and he uh, bends sprinkles over a chair, and he's pushing on him from behind, like bam, bam, trying to get this dude to stop choking. And I was like, whoa, this is oddly erotic for trying to save somebody's life at the same time, and it's getting crazy. Uh, sprinkles, he spits up a little bit of something, but he's still choking. Super manager, he's got tired. He calls somebody from out of the back in the kitchen and they tag team. Now it's his turn. And I don't know who's cooking in the kitchen, but super manager says that my food is ready. And I'm like, I wanted to see how this was going to end, but I got to go. We just been at church all day and my wife is hungry. I go out to the car and I give my wife the food. And I'm trying to tell her about sprinkles, and she ain't trying to hear none of it. What she want to know is, did you use the coupon? It's like, I don't, I was like, sprinkles, though. She was like, you better get back in there and use that coupon, <laughs> or it's going to be two sprinkles today. Like, All right. So I go back in there. When I get back in there, uh, sprinkles has gone from a, uh, a Heimlich situation to a look like a CPR situation. He laying on the floor and his face is purple and he looks darker than me. I'm like, man, this is not going well. And I look at the super manager like, man, I know you got this situation, but I'm gonna have a situation too. Can you fix this coupon situation? <laughs> and he is super manager. So he started fixing the coupon situation and we just all just staring there, looking at sprinkles on the floor. Then I hear the voice again. And again, I'm diminishing it by just calling it a voice. I've been praying and been a minister for so long that I know this voice internally. And usually it's things like the back of my mind and conscious things like, don't do that, don't go over there, don't do this. But this time, the voice told me, I just got out of church. If you touch sprinkles, or if you touch that man, he's gonna get back up. And I was like, whoa! I never had this before. And I trust the voice. And so I know 100% that if I do what the voice tells me to do, that it's going to happen. But I have some hesitation. Because I know, or I believe, that if I do this, it'll change who I am or the type of minister that I am. I'm fine being a hole in the wall preacher, assistant pastor that nobody knows. I'm fine being that person. And I don't want to be some mega pastor or somebody that's blowing on this side of the crowd and everybody falls out. I don't, that's not me. That's not my personality. I don't want to be that type of person. 
And so now I'm trying to negotiate in my mind, like, how can I do this without anybody knowing? I was like, maybe I can just go and kick sprinkles or something. That's a touch. Maybe that'll work. But the boy said, lay hands. I was like, so I, I guess I got to touch him with my hand. And now I'm trying to figure out maybe I can go over and pretend like I'm tying my shoe and touch him. And whatever happens after that, it just happens. And while I'm negotiating this in my mind, super manager, he was like, all right, I fixed your coupon situation and you good to go. And so now I gotta decide what I'm going to do. At the same time, I see the paramedics pull up. And it's like, what am I gonna do? And Sprinkles is over to my left. And the exit is over to my right. And I know for certain, that if I do what the voice tells me to do, that it's gonna happen. And I walk to the right and I get out of there. I go back to my car, I tell my wife the coupon situation was fixed. And we're driving home. And I'm trying to figure out why didn't I do it? I was 100% certain that something was going to happen. To this day, I still believe it. And I finally came to the conclusion that I don't believe in forcing what I believe onto somebody else, no matter how much I believe that it's going to help them. And so I don't know what happened to Sprinkles. I hope that he was all right, but me forcing my religion or forcing my belief on him definitely wasn't going to help. And so it took me a while, but I became satisfied with that conclusion. And I'm riding home with my wife and I ask her, so how was that barbecue? And she says, it was to die for. <laughs> In about 10 words, how did you find your faith or lose it? When I learned religion has done more harm than good. Oh, that's a good one. One more. At the bottom, there was still something in me and out there. Gary Blevins, everybody. As I said in my first story, I tried. I wanted it bad. Like I, I did, I wanted it bad. Um, but. As I grew older and I became an adult, I, I came to understand that the worst thing that you can call someone is crazy. Because it's dismissive. It means everything that they have to say after that has no value. You can be an asshole, you can be a bitch, you can be any one of those things and still be right. And still have valuable things to say. But once someone has called you crazy, that is the end of the conversation. So since I've come to that realization, I have used that word sparingly and on purpose, and I've listened very intently whenever anybody else has used it. Because as I said, it has a tendency to shut down the conversation, which means it can be used as a weapon to undermine people that are maybe saying something that somebody else doesn't want them to say. So, when someone is called crazy, it actually makes me want to hear more about what they have to say to determine for myself whether or not they really are, you know, crazy. So this really got put to the test when the Church of Scientology moved into our town. Now, in Florence, Kentucky, uh, the Church of Scientology bought a, an old Baptist church, 
the church had moved on to a much, much larger facility, but this was already a big facility. And my wife and I decided that we wanted to go and investigate. We were treating it kind of as a anthropological exploration, right? What do these people think? What do they believe? And because we had heard them called crazy, we wanted to make sure that they got every opportunity to tell their story, right? I mean, that's the objective, I think, is to do everything you can to understand as much as you can wholly about where everybody else is coming from so that you can make up your own mind. So we wanted to give them our best, give them their, their best opportunity. So we walked in, it was a Tuesday evening, and we were greeted by an usher, and that's what he was called, it's an usher, and he was a 50-ish Middle Eastern man. Uh, I'm 28, 29 at this point, and he's wearing black pants, a silver vest, white shirt, black dress tie. As are like four other people around me. It's clearly like the uniform of the usher. We explained to them what we were doing there, that we just wanted to investigate. Like, what are you guys about? We're trying to figure out what the story is here. We'd heard, you know, some mixed uh, information about your organization, and we wanted to kind of get a first-hand look. They said, that's great. We're so happy that you're here. They're very friendly. They want to make sure that you feel welcome, and they offer us soft drinks, and, and we decline, because we've heard parts of that. So we're good. Uh, but they direct us into uh, the like a museum area, which was interesting. Like where they're, like what again? You can see like the bones of a Baptist church, so it would have been like their lobby area. It's been converted into like a pretty big museum, and it really is just a giant shrine, really, to their uh, originator, a guy named L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who was a Navy officer and a science fiction writer and the originator of this religion. And I'm gonna put air quotes around religion, more on that in a minute. So we go through this and we learned that uh, the Scientologists have a complete contempt for uh, anything having to do with the field of psychology. They uh, do not believe in any part of psychology or any medication that would treat any psychiatric problem. They don't believe in any of that. And they've, you know, espoused how many, you know, prisons they've donated their services to and how many, you know, how they lowered recidivism rates and blah, 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 and all this kind of fluffiness. And we get to the end of it. The whole thing takes half an hour, 45 minutes, and it is informative, and it is very well put together, as well as any museum you'd see anyplace else. Very well done. And we get to the end, and this Middle Eastern man again greets us, and he... He hands me two metal cylinders that are, I believe they're brass. And he puts these in my hand and he starts asking me questions. How's your relationship with your mother? Nothing happens on the little meter. So how's your relationship with your father? Nothing happens on the little meter. And then he says, you know, how is your relationship with other members of your family? And the needle starts to move around. And he says, oh, it seems like you might have some issues with some other members of your family. I'm having flashbacks to the last time I had a psychic reading, right? Like he's asking these probing questions, just waiting for something to happen. And I immediately see through what that is. But apparently what this machine is, is an ohm meter. They're measuring the electrical resistance that's passing through my body. Because what they believe is that trauma causes what they call M-grams to form in the brain. And these M-grams, going all the way back to prenatal, are what cause mental illness and general unhappiness. And if there are any Scientologists in the audience and I'm getting this wrong, this was the understanding that I left with that day, so it's your fault. So, <laughs> but this is what they believe. So, and they believe this can be measured. So you put your hands on these, these brass tubes with these wires attached to this ohm meter, and then they ask you questions until it moves, and then that is where the M-grams are stored in your brain that they can now help you get rid of. Well, that's weird, but okay. So. I'm like, uh, that's, that's, uh, needless to say, I was skeptical. He does the same thing to Jamie, puts the, my wife, puts the, uh, the cylinders in her hands and reads the, answers basically the same questions and 
she has basically the same response. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and then it wiggles a little bit, and oh, that must be where your problem is. Well, okay then. That's weird, but all right. Now, at this point, we've been there for an hour and 20 minutes. I have yet to hear a single thing about their philosophy other than what I have read in the museum. No one has told me what they're about, right? Like, if I walked into a church and I said, what are you guys about? Someone in the first 20 seconds would say Jesus, right? That's, that would happen, right? Any church in this country, Jesus would come out of somebody's mouth, right? This is not what's happening here. So I said, okay, so that's interesting. He can sense my skepticism. I said, so, so tell me about what you believe. Tell me what you're thinking. And they said, well, it'll be easier if you complete this personality test. Then we can tell you more about uh, parts of our church that will be more germane to you. And I'm an egomaniac, and I always want to know what, you know what people think about me. So okay, fine. I'll fill out your, your personality test. Not knowing that I was agreeing to a personality test that was 220 questions long and took an hour and a half. So, fine. Jamie, my introverted wife, was thrilled. <laughs> she's like, but she was game, she did great, she was right along with me. And so uh, we, they separate us for the first time. And we're like in adjoin, adjoining cubes, right? And we're filling out the thing, and it's a lot of the same questions just asked a different way. It's kind of a little, it's a little weird, but I've seen tests like this before. So fine, and thankfully it's a Scantron test, so it's not like somebody's gotta go grade the thing. So they, we finish up after however long, and we give them the thing, and they say, okay, great, and we're gonna get your results, and uh, Mr. Blevins would step in here, Mrs. Blevins step in here, now they have us in different offices. We're now separated completely. I can't see where she is, she can't see me. I do not like this, but I'm along for the ride, I'm gonna see how this goes. So this, a new person that is introduced to me who is wearing black pants, a white shirt, and a black tie. He does not have the vest on. I guess there's a promotion, you don't have to wear the vest anymore. But he, I don't know. So he, uh, I don't remember what his title is, but he used the term auditor. I'm not sure if he was an auditor or if there was somebody else that had services. I don't know what the whole story was there, but he's there and he's got this chart in front of him and it is a, it's a chart that is a uh, line graph, so it's a, it's a grid. There's a line that runs across the center, and my results are overlaid on this, and they do this. Okay, there's this giant valley in the middle of my chart. And the guy says, wow, we got something going on here. Hmm. I said, well, that is interesting, what is, what is that? And again, I'm an egomaniac, and he can clearly sense that. So he's, he knows he's got my attention. So he says, this is the result. This, what this tells us is that you have trouble uh, dealing with people that are struggling. That, that, and he, used, he chooses his words carefully here, that you think are inferior. This was the first time he introduced this word, inferior. And I thought, so wait, what do you mean? He says, so you get impatient with people very quickly. And I thought, well, that's odd. I was 28 at that point. I had been in customer service for 10 years, an entertainer for 15 years. It was my job, it was my specialty to go into hostile situations to de-escalate customer service problems in a casino with tens of thousands of dollars on the line at any given moment. It is my job. It is the core of what I am good at. It is what I get paid for, is to be able to do this thing and do it well. But this chart, it's got this big valley in it. And I, so I probe a little more. I said, oh, so what on this test like, gave you that impression? And he pulls out the test, he's like, okay, question 137, you, you know, he reads it, and I said, okay, well, this is how I interpreted it, and this is why I answered that way. He says, oh, I'm sorry, we can't change the answers moving forward, you answered how you answered, we can't make any changes. I'm like, okay, so now what? He says, well, we have a class. 
that we would like to invite you to. It's an eight week class, meets twice a week, two hours a night here at the church. It's a classroom setting and it's $450. And in that instant, I knew what it was going on. This was an elaborate sales pitch. This whole thing had been an elaborate sales pitch. They had, their process was to attack the thing that they determined that I was good at, a core piece of my personality. The purpose was to attack that thing and then replace it with their thing, with their beliefs and with their thought process. They were trying to supplant my self-esteem. This is step one in drawing people into a cult. I immediately saw all this as soon as he said the dollar figure. And I said, I imagine you have other classes as well. He's like, oh yeah, we've got a whole line of classes. I said, well, what if I wanted to take a time management class? Because I can use some help with my time management skills. He said, well, we really try to go with what the test tells us. Because we don't think you need help in time management right now. They're, they know I have a weakness there that they can't exploit because they need to break down my strength first so that they can control me. And I said, I've learned all I need to learn for today. I really appreciate your time. And I said, I, I see what's going on. I see that this is a sales pitch. And as soon as I said that, you should have seen the look on his face. It just changed like, oh well. Like I had seen the behind the magician's coat. Right? Like I had seen the magician drop a coin. But he knows that my wife's in the other room. So he keeps talking. He's now making small talk with me. And I stand up and I start to head for the door. Dude stands in the door of his little office. And I, again, I'm good at reading people. I know what's happening. This dude is, I read his body language immediately. He's trying to get between me and my wife. He's trying to stop me from leaving the room. Because if they struck out with me, that doesn't mean they're gonna strike out with her. So I step past him and step into the hallway. He steps in front of me and now is blocking the hallway. I step around him and I said, it's been nice talking with you. And I walk into the office where my wife is sitting and she's looking at a chart, I'm not making this up. She's looking at a chart where everything is above the line. It's a very nice little wave. But the one little lower point is time management. Now my wife could teach classes to the Marines about time management. <laughs> this is one of the most productive people you will ever meet in your life. But they were doing the same thing to her and what I, when I saw that it just confirmed everything that I had thought in the room that I had been in. They were trying to attack the thing that she was best at so that they could supplant her self esteem. And I said, honey, do you really think that you need help with time management? And she's, you know, humble. So she said, well, you can always get better. I said, of all the things in your personality, why do you think it is that that's what they decided to hone in on? Well, I don't know. I said, well, maybe it's because they're a cult. <laughs> and maybe they're trying to break you down so that they can build you up and take all of your money. Have they talked to you about the time management class? He said, he, she said, he mentioned it, but we haven't gotten that far. And I turned to him and said, it's $450, isn't it? <laughs> and he said, it is. And he had the same look on his face as the guy before. Like, oh, we lost another one. So we left. And as I processed what had happened, right, I was thinking back to when I was a kid and how I didn't feel what they wanted me to feel. And I, I started to think about what it meant to supplant my self-esteem. And 
they kept telling me when I was young, they kept telling me that I needed to be saved, that I needed to be saved, that, that, that God would save me. The basic principle that no one ever seemed to consider is that I don't need to be saved. I don't need you to take away my self-esteem so that you can supplant it with your cure. I love my Christian friends. I love my mother. She, as we go back and forth about this forever and ever and ever. But for me, based on my experience, what I saw in that Scientologist's office crystallized for me what I had felt my whole life, which is that they're trying to sell me something. They're trying to tell me how to live and they're trying to take my money while they do it. But to do that, they've got to break me down first. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I am not a wretch. A wretch is two things. It is either vomit or it is a person that has no worth. I am neither of those things. And so when you talk to an atheist and they seem angry, like I've seen now, that's why. Because when someone comes at us with, with those kinds of philosophies, with those kinds of beliefs, that's what we hear. That's what we hear. And, and I understand, because I love people that are Christians and, have, and Jewish and Muslim, I understand that that is what brings them peace and it helps them be better people and I love them for that. And I love that they love that. I love that for Sean. But it's my time with those crazy, crazy, crazy Scientologists made it crystal clear for me that my path was never going to go that way. Thank you. So, by the time I'm about, by the time I'm 30, I'm pretty good at the, the preaching thing, if I have to say so myself. And, you know, people would tell me, you know, I was kind of good at it. Um, and people would invite me to, to preach places and different things. And for a while, like, to be able to pray for an hour was a hard milestone for a lot of people. But I was able to do it with ease by this time. I could pray, I could study, I could do all of these things, I could teach people the principles that, you know, that were taught to me. And I was pretty good. Um, one Saturday, it was a prayer meeting and we were praying for an hour. We were at the church and the church is not in the best neighborhood. So we were praying in the sanctuary. You would have to listen out in the back just in case somebody came in that didn't have the best intentions. And one day we're praying and that exact situation happens. I hear something in the back while we were praying and I get up and I go to see what was going on. And there's this woman and she's like rummaging through the supply closet. Uh, my wife loves coupons and she would stack the church up with all kinds of like soaps and paper towels and all these other things. And this woman had a box of them. And she was getting ready to get out of there with them. And I get back there and I startle her. I guess she didn't expect anybody to, to come back there. And I can tell, like, you know, she's got some type of uh, drug struggles or something like that going on. And she's got this box of dish detergent ready to walk out the door. And I'm like, you know, you can't take those. <laughs> Could you put them back, please? And she puts them back, and, and she's getting ready to leave. Um, and as I walk her 
her to the door, I'm looking her right in her eyes and her face, and she is asking for help. And to my knowledge, I give her the best help that I believe that I could give her at that time. And I said, you should come back tomorrow. Let me preach to you. As if I was good enough to preach her out of her situation or, or whatever the case may be. And she turned away defeated and she just left. She's probably just happy that, you know, we didn't call the police or, or something like that. And I went back to pray, to finish this prayer, because this is what I do. And that woman's face started haunting me. Like, what are you praying for? The thing that you should be praying for, just walk through the door. What are you doing? And over time, that thought and that woman's face would just haunt me. And I would think like, what are we doing? Is this the way that church is supposed to be ran? Is this the way that it should happen? And I started questioning a lot of things. And I had this existential question that I couldn't answer. And so I did what most men in their 30s do when they have an existential question that they can't answer. I started a podcast. It's called For the Love of God. And I was interviewing people about the intersection of religion and, and how it impacted our lives, good or bad. And I talked to atheists, I talked to Jews, I talked to people, who, uh, Muslims, LGBTQ, all different types of people and had some great conversations and, and insight. And one day, I find myself outside of the Planned Parenthood because I want to interview somebody from Planned Parenthood. They're always in the news. And these things are always happening. And so one day I drive down to the Planned Parenthood, never been there in my life. Found out I, I've been riding past it and did, just didn't even know what it was. And when I get there, it's on a Saturday and religion is just breaking out in front of the, the, the Planned Parenthood. There's people out there with signs and all types of different things going on. I park my car and I'm walking up to the door and I see this guy, this white guy out there with his son, maybe like 15 years old. And I ask him, like, you know, what are you, what are y'all doing? And he starts spouting off some stuff, like, you don't know what they're doing with these fetuses and all that. It's like, dude, you sound crazy. <laughs> I didn't tell him that, but hoping maybe I get this dude on the interview. <laughs> and I was like, okay, leave this dude alone. I go into the Planned Parenthood, and. I find out a lot about Planned Parenthood. Like, they do like sex education and they do other types of like medical services other than abortions. I was like, wow, this, this place is awesome. Why are these people out here <laughs> doing this? And while I'm waiting to talk to the communications director, I'm a professional people watcher. And I see this young black woman, she walks past me in distress, with like tears coming down her eyes. And she walks past me so close that we're looking almost like eye to eye. And I can only imagine like what she's going through or what she's dealing with in my, uh, I just have complete compassion for her. Like, man, I don't, 
I wish there was something I could say or do to make you feel better in this moment, but I, I knew that I couldn't do anything. And so when I was done talking to the people at the Planned Parenthood, I walked back out and they must have changed shifts because that guy, he was gone and now there were some new people out there. And there was one lady in particular, a Hispanic woman, and she had um, a small child with her, her daughter, maybe like seven or eight years old. And this Hispanic woman was on her knees on the concrete praying harder than anybody I ever saw in my life. And in that instance, it was almost like there was a mirror reflected back on me because I'm looking at this woman like, what are you doing? Whatever you're doing, you may think that you're helping or whatever you think that you're doing, but you really just making it worse. Like these are actual people in here that are going through things and, and dealing with situations and, and circumstances in life. And the best that you can do is to sit here on the concrete and make people feel uncomfortable when they go in or come out. And it just made me realize that the things that I was doing sometimes may have made people feel uncomfortable. And maybe what I was doing was not the best way to go. And it took me a while because I was a minister, an elder in the church. I had position, I had a title. I had people who looked up to me. I had people who would tell me that you're a good preacher. You're good at this. You're gonna go far. And I liked hearing that, even though sometimes I would say, don't tell me that, I don't wanna hear that. I liked who I was and my identity was caught up in that and in church. It was who I was. I didn't meet my wife until I was a minister. My kids didn't even know me outside of basically my church identity. But something in me told me that I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't be the preacher anymore. I couldn't just be in front of people and not actually try to help them. Just preaching was not enough. I needed to do more. And I realized that through that situation that the best worship that I could give to God was not praying or preaching or running the church service and all of these other things. The best way I believe to worship God is to actually serve other people is to actually show empathy and to show love, even the people that you don't agree with, even the people who don't look like you, even the people who do things that you may not agree with. And so I quit being a minister and I quit being a preacher and it was hard. I went back and switched churches a couple of times. <laughs> But in the end, I became better for it. I became a better husband. I became a better father. And I still go to church. But now I go for community and see how I can help somebody else. Thank you. Hail to thee, O Bradford High School, alma mater, hail. We, thy faithful sons and daughters, thy fair name revere. Friend of learning, guide to manhood, may thy cause prevail. Hail 
to the old Bradford High School, alma mater hail. I went to a very big high school in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and when I mean big, I mean big. It, we had a, a student body of a little over 5,000 students, and we had two football fields, two soccer pitches, ten tennis ball court or tennis yeah tennis courts. We had an Olympic-sized swimming pool, diving facility. We had a planetarium. In my high school, big school. And when I was chosen, along with three of my uh, classmates, to sing the alma mater at our graduation, and now I know it's the song that everyone waits just to be over because no one's actually listening to the song. But when I was chosen to sing this familiar tune with wildly outdated lyrics, <laughs> I was honored. And it was, it was a thrill because my field house at my high school sat 10,000 people. And this was a tough ticket to get. And it was also televised, so there's another 10, 15, 20,000 people watching on TV. It was the biggest performance I had ever done. And I was graduating from high school, so it was a pretty proud day for me. I felt pretty good about myself that day. Jump back six months, my uh, father is a senior chief in the United States Navy, it's 1993, and he's stationed in Norfolk, and he is uh, driving to work one day on the base, he had kind of an office job, and he's just, uh, pulled up to a stop sign on the base and gets tapped from behind by another driver, somebody who was just late for work and wasn't paying attention. But when you get bumped on a Navy base and you have any kind of accident, you immediately have to go in for a drug and alcohol test. And my father, who was standing there looking sober as a judge, blew three times the legal limit at 7.45 in the morning. Hadn't had a drink in 10 hours. This was just his walking around buzz. And no one would have ever known that he was that intoxicated all the time. All the time. It was a fifth of Jack, and or Jim Beam and Water, excuse me. Jim Beam and Water, every day. So the Navy, you know, they, it's the Navy. So they, they order him to go to the only alcohol treatment facility in the entire Navy in 1993, which was in, uh, at the Great Lakes Naval Base, which was about 30 minutes away from my beloved alma mater. And this created an opportunity for me to be there for my father while he went through this rehab. And my, we hadn't been particularly close. My parents divorced when I was very young, and he lived in Virginia. I lived in Wisconsin with my mom and my stepdad. And it was Christmas and two weeks in the summer every year. And so, you know, you do what you can. You know, you visit, you get bit by the dog, you go to the amusement park, and, you know, that's what, that's what you get, you know. And you talk to each other on birthdays and Father's Day and whatever. Um, so we hadn't been particularly close, and so this was an opportunity to kind of develop that relationship. So he was gonna be there for four weeks, and I went down on the Saturdays, we'd be there for three hours. It was January, unfortunately, so when we would go outside to smoke, it was freezing cold, but we still had really good conversations, and felt like we were actually connecting and I'm 17 at this point, right? So we're, you know, I'm, you know, I, yeah. to say that I was an adult at that time is an indulgence, but of course, you know, 17, you're starting to feel like an adult anyway. So I felt like I was starting to, to talk to my father more as another man and not, you know, whatever. It was, it was, a, it was an attempt anyway. So we, I see him for the first two weeks, and then the third week I decide to bring my girlfriend, Janet, with me. We've been together for almost two years, and I thought it would be nice for her to have a, chance to meet my father, and that went really well. And then the fourth week, I was there for his graduation from this ceremony. He got a chip, an AA chip, and he got a, um, a certificate of completion. <laughs> he was now sober. Uh, now, my mother and my stepfather are also recovering alcoholics, so I had been raised in Alateen and Al-Anon and adult children and all of that, so I, I had you know, an understanding of what needed to happen here. So. So I was right there, right? I know how important you know, family engagement is with this kind of thing. So I was with him the whole time, drove him to the airport from the base, 
and send them back to Norfolk. And that, you know, when you get home, it's meetings or, you know, you're find a, you know, find a sponsor, go to a meeting, don't drink. Okay. He's like, I got it. And he gets on the plane and he flies home and lets me know that he gets home okay. And we speak sporadically uh, because now I'm also a senior. It's my you know, spring semester of my senior year. I'm running around. I'm the president of three organizations on campus. I've got school trips and there's a planetarium. So I'm busy, right? So, um, so I get, uh, it gets time for graduation and I send him an invitation. And he RSVPs, yes, is going to bring his wife, Allison, and they're going to be there, and it's going to be great. It's like, okay, cool, and I don't think anything about it. About a week before, I call again. He says, yeah, it's going to be there. It's going to be good. And I've got my ticket, flying out of Norfolk, got to stop in um, Atlanta, and then to Chicago, and then be driving up. Okay, cool. So he's going to rent a car. Doesn't need anybody to pick him up. Sweet. Again, wrapped up, graduating in a week. I got my finals. I'm not track. I'm not keeping track of what he's doing. But he's got a ticket. I saved a ticket for him and Allison. Should be good to go. So I'm standing up there, all my mater hail, in front of 10,000 people that are clapping because the song is over, <laughs> uh, which was, which is fine. Um, but it was still, it was still a thrill. And so uh, now I've, I, there's some massive people. So I've started looking, and I find my mom, and I find my stepdad, and I find my sister, and my grandmother, who had four of the six tickets that I was allotted, and. I see them, and they're like, okay, okay, congratulations, hugs, kisses, pictures. They go. And then I see some of my friends, but they're with their family, and hugs and pictures, and da, 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 hey, man, have a good life, whatever. Off we go. And the room's starting to thin out. I still haven't found my father or Allison. And, like, so now I'm starting to worry, right? Like, this is, you know, we just spoke. Like, this, something must be wrong. So I find a pay phone. Yes, this is 1993, so there's a pay phone, but um, I don't have any change. So I'm walking around the gymnasium, the field house, bumming quarters off of people so I can call Norfolk. And I scrounge up about $1.75 and I plug my quarters into the thing and I dial the number. And Allison answers the phone. And I said, Allison, what's going on? I said, You guys are supposed to be here. Like, we have tickets for you. And, and she's quiet. And she said, your dad's not here. Which is odd, because I hadn't asked. I just said, where were you? And she said, he's not here. And I said, OK, well, well, where is he? And she's quiet. And I'm starting to put it together. And she says, he's at, please deposit $1.75 for the next He had gone to the bar instead of going to the airport. Maybe that's him. Who knows? <laughs> it's probably, not. probably not him. I don't think that's him. It's probably not him. Very low probability. But yeah, he had chosen to go to the bar instead of come to his kid's graduation. And needless to say, that, that left a mark. Um, that hurt a lot. And particularly after, like we had just had this big connection with him going through rehab and I was there at his graduation and I'm standing there when he gets his chip and it was a whole thing and um, he met my girlfriend and it was just like, I felt like we had this like, finally, finally this connection, right? Not there. So the fallout from that for me, uh, it's easy to say that that moment had a substantial shift in the trajectory of my life. Things changed dramatically after that. Um, I blew up that relationship with Janet in about two weeks and got into a relationship. And Janet was beautiful and we had a, a lot of fun together and she was, just, she was super sweet. Got into another relationship with another beautiful young woman and hurt her badly, and then got into another relationship, and another, and another. And I hurt a lot of people along the way. And I was looking, in retrospect now, I understand what I was looking for was I was trying to fill that hole with what I thought was love. Now, when, when I've, 
when I've thought about this, the, the idea that you know, you're 18 years old, you're 19 years old, of course you're supposed to be out like, doing whatever it is that you can get done, right? Like, hey, all right. And this was not fun for me. This was not about pleasure. It was about need. It was an addiction. So school became implausible. So I decided to go on the road with the Renaissance Fair. And I landed in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I brought a girl with me <laughs> uh, on this extravaganza. And within two weeks of the fair ending, uh, we I had found someplace else to stay, and I immediately blew up the relationship with the girl and sent her home, and started a relationship with this new woman that we had been staying with. And three weeks later, we're pregnant. And I saw this as an opportunity to, to rediscover my own innocence. Right? So, to, this was a new leaf. This was a new chapter. I was going to be able to make a life with this person and have a child and love this child and pour all the love into this child that I never really got from my father. Right? That was, that's kind of where, how I put it together in my own mind. Right? But part of that was being faithful to this woman. Right? So I decided that no matter what happened, I was going to be faithful to this woman, and it was the worst decision of my life. Because this turned into the single most toxic relationship that could have ever been. She was a master manipulator and wildly unfaithful. She is the worst person that I could have possibly sworn this fidelity to. She did a lot of damage to me. She did a lot of damage to my son. And, of course, that ended, in, mercifully, in divorce. And when it did, uh, it was December 12th of 2000, and 12-12 of 20, and then two months later, unfortunately, I got laid off from my job that I'd had for almost five years. And, but I had a job offer in Jacksonville, Florida, and I will tell you, the relationship with my ex-wife was literally making me crazy. Like, it was making me do things that were counter to my character like desperate things, because I was so desperate to not, re, to, to not have my son relive what I had gone through with this absentee father, right? So it was just incredibly painful, and, but I knew I had to get away from her if I was gonna be healthy on my own at all, and that I would have to come back for him. So that's what I did. I went down to Jacksonville, I interviewed for the job, and I hadn't decided what I was gonna do yet, but I. On the way back to Cincinnati, I stopped, took a detour to Virginia to see my old man. I hadn't seen him in a long time, wanted to see what was going on with him. And he tells me when I get there, within 15 minutes of being there, he tells me that he is now sober. I said, well, that's great, Daddy. That's really exciting news. When did you go to your first meeting? He says, I don't go to meetings. There's nothing but drunks there. I said, okay. I said, well, how are you planning to stay sober then? He says, Jesus is going to keep me sober. I said, okay. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> and now, mind you, I'm uh, 24, 25, and I have all this pent-up bullshit from this incredibly toxic marriage. And I'm an atheist, and I'm angry at everything. And here is my father telling me that he's going to be sober because Jesus is going to keep him sober. Okay, cool. So what I should have done in that moment, what I should have done is, oh, well, that's great, Dave. I hope that works out for you. If you want to find a meeting, here's how you do it, right? There's a website you can go to. It's got meetings in your area. And if that's the direction you want to go, then go do that. But that's not what I did. I spent the next four and a half hours sitting at his kitchen table attacking everything that he believed in and pointing out all of the contradictions in the Bible and all of the foibles that men have when they try to, to tell other people that they understand the will of God. All of it. I levied my considerable arsenal at him. 
the next morning as I was leaving to head back to Cincinnati and try to pick up whatever pieces existed in my life, I, it dawned on me what I had done. It hadn't occurred to me in the, in the moment what I was doing. It dawned on me as I was driving away and I thought, you are such an asshole. If that was the thing keeping this dude sober, then who the hell are you to try to take it away from him? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? And I struggled with that for a long time. And what I came up with was that, and I learned this actually from a conversation with one of my Jewish friends. They have a high, hol a high holy day called um, Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, you ask forgiveness from God for your sins. But they have another holiday called a Rev Yom Kippur, which comes the day before Yom Kippur. And on a Rev Yom Kippur, you have to ask forgiveness from people before you can ask forgiveness from God. So here my father is feeling absolved of his sins, feeling redeemed, feeling cleansed, feeling reborn. His words. But he never tried to make amends with me. And so as he reached out for the love and acceptance that I had been asking for my whole life, as he reached out for it as desperately as I had, instead of reciprocating that, seeing that for what it was, and responding with acceptance and love, I went at him with daggers. So as I was preparing my father's eulogy two years ago, I quoted the Bible. Love is patient, love is kind, all of that. But I also quoted Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. And the quote that I used from him was, uh, love is an active noun, like struggle. To love someone is to accept them for who they are and who they need to be right now. And it, when I said those words at the pulpit at this church that he had never been to, that to to try to honor my father and to try to comfort my family, I was flooded again with that, that guilt, that knowing that I had so severely failed, so horribly failed at being the faithful son that I had sung so proudly about at my, own, at my graduation. And this is the big difference, I think, between how Christians and atheists see the world. My Christian friends believe that they will see their loved ones again in heaven. My Hindu friends believe that they may see them in the next life. Well, I don't believe any of that. So what that means for me is that the opportunity for him to make amends with me is gone. And my opportunity to ask for his forgiveness is also gone. And I'm going to have to live with that. I'm going to have to learn from that. And what's the lesson that I take away from that? The lesson that I take away from that and have ever since then is make sure that the people you love know that you love them. And if you've wronged someone, reach out, ask forgiveness. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. And that's what it means to be an atheist. Thank you. Oh, question. To the theist, that'd be you, Sean. To the theist, what would it take for you to lose your faith? Ooh, that's a good question. What would it take to lose your faith? I believe that there are a lot of things that could change my mind about a lot of stuff. And so, for me, faith is a journey that I go on every day. And I have to reassure myself all the time. So to honestly answer the question, almost anything could shake my faith, but I have to constantly reassure myself and, and, and say the things that, you know, that got me to where I am now. I hope that answers the question. Uh, to me, what would it take to find your faith? If the question is, what would it take to make me a Christian? Um, evidence. Evidence. Prove it. When did you stop believing in Santa Claus? 
1986, I was six years old. And every year after that, Christmas missed us. <laughs> because my dad is one of those uh, people who was caught up in like the crack epidemic. Mm. And we missed a lot of Christmases, or as I would call them, Thanksgiving too, Electric Boogaloo, because whatever we did for Thanksgiving, we would just do for Christmas, and it was like, it's just no gifts. And it was hard to believe in Santa Claus after that. Right, yeah. If you don't believe in God, how do you explain your soul? Hmm. Well, this is an interesting question because it assumes that I have a soul, which forces me to believe that I have a soul, which is a different thing. Um, I will say that I, I do know, because it's been proven, it's been shown, that at the moment of death, that the brain releases enough energy to start a car. Now, I also know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Thermodynamics. So what that means is that it can never be destroyed, it can only be changed. And energy, like water, dilutes. So when energy is released from the body, it dilutes into the universe around it. We know this for a fact. This is proven. This is just a known thing. So if you ask me what happens to my soul, and I interpret that soul as what happens to the energy that's in my body when I die, it rejoins the collective energy that is everywhere around us. I gave this eulogy at my sister's funeral, actually, and I made this particular point, which was tricky. That's a whole other story by itself. The atheist going up to give a eulogy in a Baptist church in front of my Christian family. You can imagine there was some complexity there. Um, but so, but the, my point was that I don't, I don't look for my sister in the ground, right? Because that's just her, that's just what's left behind, right? The energy that she left is now in the trees in, in Wisconsin or in the sunrise in Lake Michigan or, I mean, that's, that's where we go. And I know that's true. I know it. I can prove it, right? So that's what, so, and to believe all of that and to know all of that doesn't force me to believe in God. Why don't churches promote gun control? Ooh, good question. One of the things I, I wasn't totally able to get out in one of my stories was that um, church is basically a business. It's a peculiar business, but it, the way most churches are ran, they are a business. The same should, way a hospital is a business. They should pay taxes. They want to like make money, but you know they still want to help people at the same time. And so, if church is a business, sometimes you have to skirt away or or not touch on iffy subjects if you want to have people keep coming in and giving money or just being a part. So it's a marketing decision. I believe so. For mo I mean, there are some churches, they don't care though. They will tell you, they will get up and they will say, yeah. hey, this is the way it is. This is what we believe. So not all churches, but some churches, yes. that's, yeah, that's them up. I agree. I believe. Sean, if God makes our morals and teaches us, then do you believe laws in the government be made based on religion? Quick answer, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't believe like anybody's, like I said, I don't believe in forcing religion on somebody else or your beliefs on somebody else. I do believe in democracy and I do believe in collective minds coming together for the greater good and sometimes the majority may have that Christian bent and they may vote in a certain way and that's just democracy but no I don't believe religion should shape laws. All right, last one. Is God real? It's a quick one. 
It is a bit of an existential question. Um, but I will say that God is not real for me. But he might be real for you. And if, and if that is the thing that works for you, then by God, go do that thing. Right? So long as, it, so long as you're not making laws and you're not hurting other people, so long as your law isn't, doesn't stop me from not believing in your thing, then I don't give a shit what you do. Right? If it makes you happy and it brings you peace and it makes you be a better human, well, then have all the gods you want. There have been 3,000. Pick whichever one you want. If it makes you a better person, then yes. Then your God is real to you. And keep it that way. That's a little more than I was thinking was going to come off this, but all right. Thank you, everybody. Guys, thank you so much for coming out. You guys have been a fantastic audience. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please tell your friends to come to the next Spill It event. Uh, Jamie's going to play some music, and we're going to be around. If you want to have questions on the side for a couple minutes, I am going to the bar. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you.